Hi, Alec Pierce, Vintage Cuba. So I have said many, many times in my uh, tech tips and talking about Vintage Cuba and so on that we didn't have SBGs when I started diving in 1958. You remember that year? 58, yeah. Uh, that was the year Jerry Lee Lewis had a second big hit, Crazy Arms. Anyway, a long time ago. I have said many times that we did not have SPGs, submersible pressure gauges, when I started diving. I lied to you. Uh, I'm being very honest. I'm confessing right now that I actually lied to you. Uh, there was available at that time this device made by Healthways. This is a submersible pressure gauge. You see, it went on the end of a hose. And if you can see on here, you see the hose fitting here, Kevin, and, and the O-ring, and it says Healthways. And you can see very, very clearly that this is actually a submersible pressure gauge. Can you see the pin? And you can see the numbers? There you go. So I'm sorry, there actually were submersible pressure gauges. The problem is, <laughs> they didn't work very well. They certainly weren't accurate. You couldn't tell for sure if you had 500 or 300 or 1,000 or 12. And with use, it became less accurate because it was spring-loaded. And lastly, probably most important at that particular time, 1958, they were too expensive. Nobody would buy them. I'm not going to pay $65 for that personal pressure gauge. No way. With those $65. My first scuba unit, tank regulator and wetsuit cost $75. Used, slightly used, but the whole thing cost $75. I'm going to pay 60 bucks for a pressure gauge. What for? I know the tank's full of air. I got a J-valve. But anyway, I wanted to clear that up, folks, that there actually was a submersible pressure gauge of sorts anyway. So there's one of those weird things, a little heavy uh, tube with a pin on it. Those pin gauges were not very uncommon in those days. A couple of regulators had them actually built right in. Okay, let's look at some other weird stuff as well. And let's start right over here. Over here we have a, a, a device that's not, that's not really all that old. I think these came out in the 70s, that's a guess. This is called the Aqua Bell. Aqua Bell. And in case you haven't figured it out, this is not really a scuba diving item, but I got it anyway, because it has to do with diving, and it's pretty neat. I have to have a half a dozen of these. And uh, we've actually taken them into our pool here at the training center and used them, and it's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. So this is the Aqua Bell. It's a two-piece two piece uh, device. It has uh, this thing, which is just a clear bell, clear on the front anyway, a little tube extension on the top, and then it has this thing here, which is a hollow yellow plastic collar with an opening on it, with a cap on it. So what you do is you take this and you fill it with shot, lead shot, or sand. Sand works as well. So that this thing now weighs about 30 pounds. 30, 35 pounds. And the reason for that is when you take it in the water, the bell part is full of air. So there's an upward lip. I'm going to guess that's about, uh, that's about uh, half a cubic foot, roughly. A cubic foot of air has an upward lift, a buoyancy of 60 some odd pounds, 62 and a quarter. So this would have a lift of about 30 pounds, 30, 31 pounds. That's about right. My figures are pretty accurate. So you fill this with something really heavy, and then you get in the water. Have someone hand it down to you, and you pick this up. Oh, oh. Sits over your shoulders like that. Can you still hear me? Sits over your shoulders, and now you can walk around on the bottom and look around and do things. Now, you can only do it for a few minutes. Because you've only got a half a cubic foot of air. And after a few minutes, you start to, you begin to realize that things aren't in focus anymore. And then you begin to realize that you can't move your legs or arms anymore. It's time to come up. <laughs> you could actually take a pump. You could actually open up this little tube on the top and run a little hose down to it. Get a little bit of fresh air pumped down to you uh, along the lines of an aquarium type pump. I'm not talking a big compressor or even a tank of air or ray of hoses or stuff we're used to. None of that. A little aquarium type pump. And you could pump a bit of air down there if you weren't too terribly deep. And this would keep a little bit of fresh air and you could stay down a little bit longer. But I thought I'd mention that to you. It's kind of neat. Aqua Bell. Bigger versions of these devices were actually quite common at one time in the Caribbean in the early days of diving in the Bahamas in particular. In fact, Bahamas had its own special Bahamas Bell, specially made copper and brass and it sat on your head with a hose to it, a real solid air, air hose. And divers would you'd pay for this and you could walk around on the bottom 15, 20 feet down and look at the coral and so on. It was pretty neat. But there you go. Personal version. Aqua Bell. Okay, let's move to this device, because this has got to be catching your attention. What the heck is this? Well, first of all, it's nothing to do with scuba. A little bit like the Aqua Bell, not really scuba related. It looks like this is an underwater tow, you know, for pulling you around underwater. Close, so pulling you around, but on the surface. 
In fact, you're limited by the tube, maybe a little longer, so you can, you can go down maybe a foot. That's about it. So uh, what is it? Well, it is a toe. It is, in fact, a toe. So let's assume that you're a scuba diver, you and your buddy, and, and, and you, you show up at a dive site, and there's a nice little shipwreck 200 yards offshore. 200 yards. Whew. Uh, 200 yards. You can't even throw a stone that far. That's a long swim. So what do you do? Uh, you get a boat, maybe, or, or you, you figure it be, and you fit. Anyway, it doesn't matter how you do it. It's going to be a lot of work. Now, if you have one of these, the aqua scooter, you have an aqua scooter. Simple. You fill it up with gas. This is a two-stroke engine. It's a real engine. You put gas and oil in there. Good. We're all set to go. All right. Check and make sure the snorkel is tight. You don't have to worry about the oil because it's a two-stroke. Gas and oil. You just give a little throttle, a little pull there. Make sure that's working okay. Yep. And then over here, the pull start. And it is actually a gasoline motor with a propeller on the back. And it floats. Yeah, the gas tank floats. So you slip into the water like this, and it floats all oh, about this level. And you say, to your buddy, okay, you ready? And he hangs on to your fins, and you hang on to these two handles like this, and you squeeze the throttle. <laughs> Five minutes, you're up to the shipwreck. Now, I suggest that you have a line with you. You know, if you know how deep the shipwreck, have a line. And we used to tie the line onto this and run the line down to the wreck and, and like that. Poor man's dive boat. That's what it could be, I suppose. Yep. The good old sea scooter. Well, we had a lot of fun on these. You get three or four of these out there with a bunch of crazy divers. Well, I don't need to tell you. You can probably picture what happened. A whole lot of fun. From the 60s. Made in Italy, by the way. Not bad. Not good. They made lots of good engines. Now, the sea scooter, 1960. Okay, let's go on. Let's go on to something else a little bit weird. This is, uh, this is not so much weird as the beginnings of a whole new aspect of scuba diving. You know that underwater photography is a big, big part of our sport now, particularly with the new digital cameras, and waterproof digital cameras and everything else. For many, many years, I did a lot of photography with homemade housings. You know, we used to make our own underwater housings. Take our camera and make a housing out of plexiglass and, and uh, screw it down within the bowl ring so we can get a rubber gasket, screw it, all kinds of stuff. The early housings, this will tickle your fancy, the early housings, we had a Schrader valve on the outside of the housing, a Schrader valve. That's the valve that's on your bicycle tire, okay? Because the, the seals weren't very good. So what we would do, put our camera in, and we'd take an air pump on the Schrader valve, and we'd pump a little bit of air into it. Not enough to pop the seals out, but enough that we could go down and the, and the housing wouldn't collapse and water wouldn't go in. You had to increase the pressure on the inside, pretty neat, huh? because the seals we had back then weren't very good. Now they're much, much better. So this is, uh, and this was advertised in Skinner, man, you're probably looking at this and saying, what is that? Kevin had a suggestion earlier, but I can't repeat that. But anyway, this is not what you might think it is. This, in fact, is a camera housing. Yeah, a camera housing. So you take your camera, you take your favorite 35 millimeter camera, and you open this up nice and wide, and you work your camera through the opening so the camera's inside, inside there. And once you get the camera inside there, you put the glass front in place, and then you put the ring around the front, and you tighten it up nice and tight, uh, 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 nice and tightly, and off you go. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that you can reach all the controls. Push, wind, and wind. Remember film? You had to wind it. Yeah, wind and see through the viewfinder. No, you couldn't do that. But you could look over. This was a very early attempt at underwater photography. And you know what? This was actually quite popular. Now these housings are very rare. This particular, are very, very rare. You can see it's not exactly well made. It's a piece of old, old plastic. And, and, and so they didn't last very long. They weren't terribly expensive, about $35. Uh, advertised in Skin Diver Magazine, if that much. Maybe not that much. And uh, in the 60s, but they were quite popular. And you can get them by mail order. Yeah, mail order. Before the internet, before drone delivery, we would call. Telephone. Remember telephones? Yeah. We would call and, and uh, how much? They're, okay. And then we would send a money order. We'd go to the Mac and get a money order for 30 bucks, put it into an envelope and address it. Yeah. Remember all that? And mail it, you see. And then about a week later, we get a box back by mail. And mail order. Just like, uh, just like Yahoo or Amazon. Like Amazon. Anyway, there you go. Underwater camera house. I want to show you nothing, something else that's uh, kind of interesting. This is no big deal. Little jar. <clears throat> you see that, Kevin? Nice cream inside of that. I want you to look at the face, what it says on the face, too. You put the cap back on. You won't see many of these around. They didn't sell many to start with. So there's the face. 
cold guard made by Scuba Pro. This should be Scuba Pro. And this will, uh, you're supposed to smear it on your lips and on your exposed skin, on the inside of your wetsuit, in places where you might get cold. It will keep you warm. This will actually protect you from the cold. Cold guard. Kind of a neat idea. We could use that today, right? Ah, hold on. A little bit of a problem. This has cold cream. Okay. It has a little bit of glycerin to make it smooth and smear easily. And it has asbestos. Asbestos? Asbestos, that's right. <laughs> this is from the 60s. And this is before asbestos became the asbestos we know and love today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, folks. Uh, it might be a little more difficult for a company to make Cold Guard today and get it on the market. Well, that's exactly what it was, Cold Guard. And you tell your friends it was Cold Guard used to smear our lips and our bodies to keep us warm while diving in the 50s and 60s that had asbestos in it. I'm still here. Huh? <laughs> anyway, okay, let's go over to here now. These were very common. I got several of these here. These are very, very common. If you're a Sea Hunt fan, if you've looked on my Sea Hunt uh, uh, list, uh, um, playlist, playlist and seen some of my Sea Hunt stuff on there, you know I have a big collection of Sea Hunt memorabilia, the largest in the world, and we have a Sea Hunt playlist. And, uh, and, and I'm taking items from my Sea Hunt collection and talking about them, how they were part of that famous uh, TV series, Sea Hunt, that so many of you I know, if you're, certainly if you're over 30 or 40, you've certainly enjoyed Sea Hunt probably. And if, you were, if you're younger than 30 and 40, you will enjoy Sea Hunt after watching it. But anyway, so this is the kind of stuff that we commonly saw on Sea Hunt. It wasn't uncommon in many, many episodes for Mike Nelson, the hero of Sea Hunt, played by Lloyd Bridges, uh, to uh, be uh, doing something underwater, and he would get into trouble. Or he would find something. Uh, or he would want to mark something. And what he would do is he would take this out of his belt. Pull out of his belt like this, you see. And then he would tie it onto the item, and then he would... Like this, and it would inflate. Yes, I'm not going to do that, but these are very old. These are 50 years old. If I tried to inflate this, all we'd hear is a bang. This became a big rubber ball and shot to the surface on the line. And it marked. You could use it to mark something, or it would go up, and his buddies on the surface, oh, Mike's in trouble. And they would send some down someone down. These were very, very common. I have several here. Look at here. This is one that's got a Dive flag on it. This is one still in the package, made by Decor, nice and bright and yellow. There's another model called the Lifeguard. Same idea, a little bit different though. This, the, the Lifeguard, this is a larger version of the Lifeguard. The Lifeguard was kind of neat because instead of having <clears throat> this firing mechanism on the outside, see like a little lever out there, instead of that, the firing mechanism was all hidden inside. So what you would do with this, <clears throat> you'd put the, uh, the CO2 cartridge. One of these is open. Uh, the CO2 cartridge, carbon dioxide cartridge, I don't even know if they still have them anymore. Carbon dioxide cartridges? I think they do. I think if you have a bar, you probably have a spitzer maker. Put a little cartridge like this is a special one. Cartridge goes in there like that, and then you screw this down on top like that, and, and, and then it would inflate. But in order to inflate this one, right about here, yep, there it is, I can feel it. There's two handles like that. It has two of them. So it became a big ball. This was actually designed, if necessary, to help you stay on the surface. There was a belt on that you could put around your tummy and inflate it. You'd look like Kevin. And this would hold you on the surface. <laughs> the lifeguard. Inflatable marker, boys. Very, very common. Many of you maybe have never even seen one. Uh, there were something that was very, very common at one time. I want to show you one more. And this is kind of exciting. You can read about these. I don't believe these are still made. There was a company called Farallon. Farallon. Exactly the way it's pronounced, Farallon. And they were a very innovative company. They made great products. Very, very good products. And, uh, but they made leading edge uh, products. They made products that nobody else made. Weird products. And um, they had weird fins. Maybe you saw on, my, uh, on an earlier vintage. Uh, they had some weird, I had some weird fins there. Well, this is one of their products that was very, very popular. Now, it's strange. <clears throat> Very popular, didn't work. Yeah, it was very popular, lots of people wanted one. They still want them today. I get divers today say, can you find me a shark dart? That's what it's called, shark dart. Written right on the case, and this is what it looks like. It's a shark dart. Now when I say it didn't work, what I mean is that the device worked. It just didn't stop sharks, okay? Let me explain what this is all about, and maybe you already have an inkling now. First of all, it's a plastic handle, very simple. And on the inside of the plastic handle, there is a 
CO2 cartridges, not one of those CO2, CO2 cartridges that we used to see all the time. Very, very common. Even they're getting rare. And the shark dart is actually a hypodermic needle. See, it's a long, sharp needle with a hole in the end, like that. You know? And you can hold this in your hand you know, you know, under the sheath, pull it out, and use it. You can also mount it. There's a standard screw. You can mount it on a, on a spear if you wanted to and shoot it or stab with it, but uh, this, this is intended to protect you from sharks. If a shark got too aggressive, then you would take your shark dart out and you would take care of the shark very simply. I'm gonna go down here, Kevin, in just, in just a moment here, and I'll show you how this works. You probably will never see this anywhere else in any time. Here's a simple demonstration of how the shark dart worked. Unfortunately, as I say, while well, the dart works, in many cases the shark wasn't phased at all, probably just irritated. So you take it out, dangerous shark, and you jab the shark with it. Like that. You see that? The needle goes into the shark skin, very, very sharp, very sharp. Goes through the shark skin inside, and the pressure on this washer here forces the CO2 cartridge to open, and the air comes rushing out inside the shark's body. He dies of a massive embolism. Serve him right, right? <laughs> right of course, I'm kidding. Uh, we know today that sharks are not the uh, evil animals that they've been made out to be in the movies and so on. And in any event, in most cases, this didn't work very well. Unless you were very, very close and got into one of the shark's vital organs, it didn't work. But neat, huh? Neat. You got it. Okay, there you go. Some weird items from the old days of scuba diving. I have lots more. We'll be back for, uh, what's this called? Weird, but weird. Weird number three, whatever it is. Weird stuff again, because I have lots, lots more. How about a buoyancy compensator? That doesn't collapse. That's hard. Okay? And other neat stuff. I have lots of it. I'll be back a, li a little later on with another vintage scuba, Alec Pierce scuba. Weird stuff. Hope you enjoyed that. Talk to you soon.